What's up? Welcome back to Nostalgia. Dave here with my Studio Ghibli movie rankings. Yes, I'm going to rank and review, run through all 23 Studio Ghibli films out in the world today. Of course, the 24th Studio Ghibli film, The Boy and the Heron, aka How Do You Live, Hayao Miyazaki's final film, is out now in Japan and will be releasing worldwide later this year. So, in celebration of that, in a very landmark moment, why not revisit uh, Studio Ghibli and talk about why it's been celebrated so much? So I'm going to go through all of the 23, the first 23 Studio Ghibli films in order, talk about what I like about each of them, and at the end I'm going to do a ranking and tier list of all those movies. And of course, when The Boy and the Heron comes out in the U.S., I will review that as well, see the description for that later. So yeah, I mean, Studio Ghibli, if you're watching this, listening to this, you probably know, but Studio Ghibli, one of the most iconic brands, period, out of Japan. Uh, Certainly the most or second most celebrated animation house in the the history of the world, honestly. It's Ghibli and Pixar. Uh, Take your pick. And, you know, I think Ghibli represents so much and has operated in such a unique way since its founding in 1985 and is really worth that examination. Of course, there's myriad video essays and so much love and affection for Studio Ghibli everywhere you look. So I'm far from the only one to say this. I think everyone everyone's in agreement, right? Studio Ghibli has an amazing track record of filmmaking, largely thanks to its two uh, co-founders, Hayao Miyazaki and Isao Takahata, they just made some amazing movies. True visionaries, masters of their craft, uh, and all and they just really delivered. And they've captured multiple generations at this point. And these are movies that really stand the test of time, re, uh, warrant, re, uh, reward, multiple viewings and revisiting. And, you know, these are movies that get passed down, you know, generation to generation, uh, especially the older ones. So there's a lot to get into here. So I just kind of just think about it, right? The the two co-founders, Miyazaki and Takahata, they, you know, came to found, co-found Studio Ghibli with producer Toshio Suzuki. They founded the studio in 1985, but of course they had their own animation careers and came to know each other throughout their, their come up, if you will. And Studio Ghibli is far from their only contributions to animation. Of course, they actually have some works outside Ghibli that they directed, and of course, works they contributed before that as well. But really, for the purpose of this, got to, you know, it's for the sake of length, too. I just got to keep it moving, talk about, you know, how things went with their films. But I think just briefly, some, some stats here. You know, Ghibli, they made three of the 10 highest grossing Japanese films worldwide, and you know, six of the uh, top 16 to further that point. I think what's been interesting too about Ghibli is, you know, my my first introduction to Studio Ghibli must have been the month of Miyazaki Toonami advertisements on Cartoon Network here in the United States. And I just remember, obviously, Steve Blum with the, the narration as the Toonami guy, like the, 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 the that ad just really ripped and captivated me. It was an excellent advertisement for uh, some of their movies. I believe it was Spirit Away, Castle in the Sky, Nausicaa, and Mononoke. So obviously four hitters right there. And I was like, wow, what is this? And that really brought my attention to what kind of uh, movies Ghibli was as I became more aware of them. Of course, Studio Ghibli, famous for hand-drawn animation. Animation that takes a very long time to create, but is so rewarding, so lifelike, so transformative as a result. And adding to that mystique at the time, of course, Studio Ghibli was not, the movies were not widely available. You know, obviously these movies are are Japanese. They came to receive English dubs, English releases, largely in partnership with Disney and uh, Miramax in the early days. That, uh, the timing of that varied. You know, some of the lesser known Ghibli movies took a long time to get an English dub or an English release. Or maybe they only get a home video dub and not actually get a theatrical release for many years later, if at all. Uh, 
that would definitely change went up and down how that went but also it's quite interesting was you know these films were never on uh tv they were never on streaming services with only specific exceptions with tv due to strict programming like they wanted to preserve the theatrical experience and really program these films so the studio ghibli fest initiative you know in the major movie theaters where they would release a few Ghibli films, re-release a few Ghibli films every year was one of the main ways you could see these movies unless you chose to buy the DVD or buy the Blu-ray. I myself, I bought the Nausicaa and Mononoke Blu-rays when they went on sale uh, over time just because that was how you could see these movies and revisit these movies, you know, in a legal way. And obviously that has changed. Studio Ghibli launched on HBO Max a few years back when HBO Max launched worldwide. And that was the first time these films were available on streaming services. And of course, they're still there today. And I think they're one of the best value ads that the Max service gives you, right? And it's really, I think the Ghibli, uh, you know, leadership changed their mind. And we're happy about the accessibility that streaming provided. And ultimately, I think we all can agree that it is great that literally the entire library is available on Max with one exception, which I'll get to when we get to that movie. and. It's uh, never been a better time to be a Ghibli fan as a result. I am also going to the Ghibli Museum in Tokyo uh, in a few weeks. Very excited to get to that. I'll perhaps talk more about that when I do. Um, Unfortunately, when I'm in Japan, the Boy and the Heron will be not available with an English dub yet. It'll be in theaters, but only in Japanese. I do not speak Japanese, so thus I'll still have to wait until the U.S. release later in the year. But I'm happy to do so. Very exciting. So yeah, I mean, thinking about the the Ghibli run to this point, founded in 1985, the first film, Nausicaa, actually came out earlier. I'll get to the stipulation there. But we have 23 films thus far. I'm sorry, 24 now, Boy and the Heron. 11 from Hayao Miyazaki, and 5 from Isao Takahata. And then 2 from Hiromasa uh, Yobayashi, and 3 from Hayao Miyazaki's son, Goro Miyazaki. And then a few other one-offs. That's kind of our, our spread there. And yeah, let's get into it. I'm very excited. So I'm just going to go through each of the films and talk about what I like about them. Got to keep it brief. You know, obviously these are movies that have so much depth to them, so much uh, to think about and reward. And each of these movies, especially the, the, the top of the top tier Ghibli movies, each of these movies deserves a lot of time and could open a lot of time. I got to try and keep it quick because I'm going to talk about 23 movies in a row. So obviously there's more to talk about, more to, more to get into. But of course, leave a comment. Let me know what your favorite movies are from Ghibli. And yeah, let's do it. Also, I'm saying it as Ghibli. Some people say Ghibli. If you're Japanese, you say Ghibli. Uh, I have talked about the pronunciation, where it came from. He actually took, I believe, an Italian word and pronounced it incorrectly. There's a whole story about that. People say it differently. Uh, You you know what I mean. I'm going to keep saying Ghibli. That's how I always understood it. And I believe that's the generally accepted English pronunciation. Nonetheless, uh, 1984, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind comes out. Notably, this is not the first Ghibli film technically, but of course it has been branded and thought of and put into the world as a Ghibli film since it came out. Ghibli, or sorry, Nausicaa was actually made by the studio Topcraft. And Topcraft, like a year later, was purchased and became Studio Ghibli. Purchased and became Studio Ghibli at the behest of Miyazaki Takahata and the producer uh, Toshio Suzuki. So even though Studio Ghibli didn't exist when Nausicaa was created, it effectively still is a Ghibli movie in terms of the DNA, in terms of the people behind the scenes, people making it. So uh, I think it's fair to still call it one. Of course, written and directed by Hayao Miyazaki. Not his first directorial film, but his first, quote, Ghibli movie. And it's based off a manga that he had wrote a few years prior. And I think, interesting, I didn't actually realize this more recently, but that manga continues the story beyond what the Nausicaa and the, of the Valley of the Wind film tells you. So there's actually more than Nausicaa's story, if you're interested. I would like to read that manga still time. I haven't actually read it. Um... And yeah, Nausicaa was one of the first Ghibli movies I had seen. Not, I think I caught it with the on Toonami, I'm pretty sure. And it, this is just a right up my alley type movie. 
very uh, reminiscent of many common Studio Ghibli f- themes in terms of the lessons and uh, interests that these movies have in terms of lasting meaning and takeaways. Of course, that would be of uh, con- conservationism and uh, protecting ecological diversity and just general environmentalism. Like, I think Nausicaa is really effective at nailing those themes. Of course, because of its hand-drawn animation, it looks amazing. The world building in this movie, so, so good. And it's just, I think it's a very transportive film that I fell in love with as soon as I saw it. There's a lot of iconic things about it, such as the glider that Nausicaa rides, some of the insect creatures, the ohms, the, some of the other guys, the uh, 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 creatures you see. But this is like, the core conflict in the movie of uh, humanity versus insects and how humanity basically caused the destruction of the world and the the impending doom of the human race due to their own um, negative effects on the environment and the environment basically fighting back against them, right? Uh, it's really prescient. And uh, I think James Cameron has said that he took a lot of influence from Studio Ghibli. This is one of the movies he has cited as an influence on him and stuff like Avatar. Uh, you can certainly see it. I think some really memorable characters. Of course, Nausicaa is an amazing heroine, this princess, uh, warrior, adventurer. She's great. Uh, Lord Yupa, definitely some Obi-Wan Kenobi type vibes as the kind of elder uh, guardian type teacher character. Um, you know, I think what, what, what's probably so uh, prescient too about Nausicaa is it's a film about the impending doom of humanity, and yet the humanity can't ban- even band together. To try and protect themselves there's all this empire building you know squabbling of factions throughout it it's just so unfortunately so so relatable you know and um you know like watching the death of nausicaa's father early on all that stuff really great um but yeah i could talk about this movie for a long time it's epic it's beautiful and really still prescient like i think nausicaa is a complete gem it's spoiler alert it's gonna be high in my list probably higher than a lot of people have it but I think it's just really totally nails what it's about and what it's doing. So that's Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. I forgot to switch my background to show Nausicaa, so we will keep it moving here. The next film, the first, quote, real Studio Ghibli movie from 1986, that'd be Castle in the Sky, also written and directed by Hayao Miyazaki uh, and produced by Takahata as well. This, and uh, Castle in the Sky, the uh, Japanese title is Laputa, castle in the sky there's a few ghibli movies where the english or international title was slightly tweaked but this is one of those but castle in the sky interesting because it's it's kind of like grounded in a semblance of the real world semblance of reality it's like the late uh 1800s and i think it's a very interesting film for a few reasons it kind of stands alone in in a few aspects um compared to the rest of the ghibli filmography where Castle in the Sky is like a true like rip roaring adventure movie. It has tons of action set pieces, and action is not really something that you get in Ghibli movies. Mononoke has a lot of action. Other than that, it's not really a a, a, a studio that tells stories with lots of action. But Castle in the Sky is like set piece to set piece to set piece for the most part. It has just kind of a a rhythm that you don't quite see throughout the rest of the filmography. Um, and it's pretty awesome as a result. This movie really rips really good time. I think it's definitely a bit of an underrated one where it's not quite as broadly popular, just famous as some of the other high end films, but I think it's like really awesome. Also notable that Castle in the Sky has one of the really true, like bona fide, like villain bad guys, uh, antagonists in its film. Most Ghibli antagonists are not as cut and dry bad. As that there's a few exceptions but for the most part um there's a lot of gray area in terms of uh you know the both sides of a conflict in the ghibli story so a few things that make castle in the sky a bit a bit unique but uh yeah just kind of this this story of these two children two legitimately children as our leads pazu and uh, shita and just the kind of the journey they go on uh, there's airships there's spies there's a pirate gang there's a lot of lot going on, but I think the movie moves at such a fun pace that it, it really progresses in an awesome way. 
like Dola and her gang, I think is really memorable. And they're again, they're they're a more typical Ghibli film where their position is bad, but by the end they're not nearly viewed as that way by the characters or by the audience. Um, you know, further than that, it has a really I think subversive way it ends where you finally get to this castle and the sky is floating castle, which has been the whole thing propelling the the whole movie. Of course, the the, the girl's crystal. It's been this MacGuffin everyone's been chasing to access and harness the power of the castle. And you get there, and the castle is quiet, you know, and there's it, it's dormant. There's, like, nothing going on with it, and it's not what you expect. And I think it's a really melancholy way for the movie to end, ultimately. And, yeah, uh, I think it's it, it's pretty fun. Nice, nice acknowledgement, I think, of steampunk as well, in terms of a lot of airship stuff, kind of the early days of steampunk as a concept. You can see those roots here in Castle in the Sky. Uh, this is also the first Ghibli movie distri- distributed by Toei. Of course, uh, it's, it's really the first true proper Ghibli movie. But again, Toei had to get started somewhere. So yeah, that's Castle in the Sky, just two years after Nausicaa. Really impressive, again, because the animation takes a long time with the hand drawing of it. And back then, we did not have a lot of animators working on each movie. So um, pretty cool. And you know, from there... Uh, we go to, just two years later, 1988, My Neighbor Totoro. So just two years later, in April 1988, you have My Neighbor Totoro coming out, which was actually released as a double feature with Grave of the Fireflies. Totoro, written and directed by Hayao Miyazaki. Grave of the Fireflies, written and directed by Isao Takahata. I'll start with Totoro. Uh, but very interesting that they came out as a double feature on the same day because they're very different films. <laughs> Getting, getting to that, of course, Totoro, very famous, because the titular Totoro is also like the uh, Studio Ghibli logo, as we all know. And this is a film that is very, very popular. Some people, many people's favorite Studio Ghibli film. I wouldn't go quite that far for myself, but it is very good. And I think this is probably one of the most popular with younger children, younger Ghibli viewers. This is one of the best first Ghibli movies to show someone young who is just getting into it. Of course, you know kids will like animated movies, but this is the the, the vibe of Totoro really sits well with I think with youth, and you know this this story of these two siblings, uh, Satsuki and Mei, going to this rural uh, home while their uh, mother is sick in you know kind of like post war Japan, but a, a true rural setting, and. They just kind of have interactions and discoveries about the the wood spirits and the forest around this rural home, and it's I think it's a great you know uh, manifestation of just just childhood, and of course the themes in this. There's some environmental themes in it, but it's almost more of like an animist animistic uh, spiritual theme that I think is more concerned about Totoro. For me, there's not quite enough like core conflict core like plot i guess you could say in totoro um but it still holds your attention i think just for i think the overall sentiment where it's like you still feel like you go on a journey with these characters even if quote not a lot happens um of course you know the umbrella bus stop scene the cat bus so many iconic moments about totoro um and of course the the tree itself was the the cap whore tree you know, that in the house, the actual house they're staying at, super memorable as well. Um, Totoro has recently become a stage adaptation, which is super cool. And also very notable where this is a film that had a modest box office, but then absolutely crushed in home video. And of course, that used to be a, you know, a secondary revenue stream. So much to the point that this movie grossed like $200 million in additional revenue just from selling DVDs. It's like kind of amazing. Um, and we don't we don't have that anymore, as we know. But uh, yeah, Totoro. It's not my favorite, but obviously it's really good. I think it perhaps stands a bit alone for it being really effective at being like a vibes Ghibli movie and being able to succeed as one of those. But uh, yeah, that's Totoro, which was released as a double feature with Grave of the Fireflies. Grave of the Fireflies. Uh, not what I would associate as a close companion of My Neighbor Totoro. Of course, people said this at the time. People say this to this day because it is obvious. Grave of the Fireflies is a 
war tragedy film. Very dark. Very sad. Not for kids. Totoro. Made for kids. How these were conceived to be a double feature? Completely lost on me, but that's what happened in April 1988. Funny enough, this is written and directed by Isao Takahata, his first film for Studio Ghibli, and it's based on a short story. But this is a this is a tough one. This is a film about in 1945 the bombing of Kobe, Japan, at the end of World War II, and we are with these siblings, the uh, Seita, a teenage boy, and his young sister Setsuko, and their uh, their father is off in the Japanese Navy, and their mother uh, gets uh, grievously injured and quickly dies as a result of the the bombing of Kobe, and thus. Seita and Setsuko, they are orphans. And this is literally about them trying to survive on their own in the aftermath of terrible tragedy that has affected their whole community. And if that sounds sad, it is. It's an incredibly devastating and gutting movie about, you know, this and Seita, old enough to understand the gravity of what's happened, trying to protect his sister and keep her spirits high and not immediately just bring her into this hard world and not necessarily you know, try and let her down easy with stuff, but also literally struggling to make sure he can take care of his sister and keep her alive and keep her healthy and things of that nature. Um, yeah, this is a tough one to watch. Um, it's very sad, but to me, it's one of the best Ghibli movies easily. It is so, so affecting. Um, an amazing war movie. Um, really shows you the pinnacle of um, animation. I think what's so impressive about it too is the way it starts off is we see uh, Seta, his body discovered dead in a subway station. We know this ends poorly. Just makes it even that more um, haunting to watch. It's really about like being with the spirits, the fireflies, and like revisiting this story. Um, you know it's not going to end well. And you know, there's so many moments that stand out to me. Of course, them, Satan and Setsuko, briefly uh, shacking up with their aunt, who grows to, grows to quickly resent them uh, for their, you know, obviously extra mouths to feed, uh, super cold to them. And then when they go on their own, find this, you know, this uh, riverside cave, trying their best to survive by, you know, stealing from others and selling their dead mother's clothing just so they could buy rice. Like, it, it's it's tough. You know, um, of course, d going to hide when air raids happen. Seita eventually using air raids as an opportunity to steal from people because, you know, no one will be around. Like, the rationing, getting to the point where it doesn't matter if you found anything to sell, there's no food to buy. Like, it's it's a brutal movie and really effective, though. I think it's really impressive. Notably, this is the Grave of the, this is the film, Grave of the Fireflies, is the film that's not on Max. It is not in that streaming catalog for Ghibli movies. And the reason for that is that this was not produced by the Ghibli parent company, uh, Tokuna Shoten. This was actually produced by uh, Shin Shinchosa, I believe is how you say it, which is the producer of the short story the film is based on. So as a, as a result, the distribution and the you know rights with this film, completely different. Um, Disney never actually had North American distribution rights for Grave of the Fireflies. Um, its first English language release was not until 2016. Um, so as a result, it's been hard to find. It's been on Hulu in the past. It's not really on a service right now, but it's currently uploaded on YouTube um, in poor quality, but it's legit. It's like the whole movie's there in full if you want to watch it that way. Um, I believe it's rentable, but this is one of the harder ones to access uh, to this point. Um, but I think cer certainly worthy, certainly worth seeking out. I think it's a really special movie, despite the fact that it's... Um, a major downer. But yeah, that's Grave of the Fireflies. Again, mind-blowing that this was released alongside Totoro. Doesn't make any sense, but that's what they did. Next up, we have Kiki's Delivery Service from 1989, written and directed by Hayao Miyazaki. This was the number one film in Japan in 1989. And yeah, Kiki's Delivery Service, great Ghibli entry, of course, very popular. Uh, this is a movie I like quite a bit. And I think this one also has a few notable... Um, specifics to it where it stands out from other Ghibli movies for a few things. Uh, this is a film about Kiki, who is a young witch who, as part of her, you know, um, uh, witch training moves 
away from home, moves to a new town to kind of become the resident witch, ingratiate herself to this new community, and kind of complete this coming of age. That's what this movie is. Coming of age story, as we know. Kiki goes to this new town, doesn't know anyone. She's only brought a uh, Gigi with her, her talking uh, black cat. And uh, yeah, this is, I think, a, ni- a really fun one where, uh, on one hand, it's really nice just to be with like something really super natural with the movie where Kiki is literally flying around on a broom. She has magical powers. And, you know, she quickly begins helping the local baker make deliveries, hence the title of the film. And. Um, encounters this nerdy uh, boy named Tombo, becomes a bit of a love interest. He's clearly very into Kiki because he's an aviation nerd. Aviation nerd uh, should be a flag to you because that is a stand-in for Hayao Miyazaki, who is a huge aviation nerd. This is a theme throughout the Ghibli filmography. And I think what's, what's interesting about Kiki's delivery service is it's coming-of-age story, but it's about... um. It's really about kind of loneliness and determining your self-worth and finding your self-confidence. And I think it's a really realistic portrayal of uh, adolescence and how you progress through that. But what's interesting about this portrayal of loneliness is this is something Kiki signed up for. She wanted to do this. This is what she had to do. And despite all that, something you want, there's times where you're not going to feel good about it. I think this is a really awesome one to show young people as well for the lessons it uh tells you about independence and again like self-worth and finding that confidence and ability to do things because that's the takeaway from the movie kiki loses her powers and then she has to save tombo at the end and she regains her confidence regains her ability uh, to fly but she eventually loses her ability to talk to Gigi. she can no longer understand her cat so that part of her juvenile part of her life has now been left behind yeah kiki's delivery service really nice pleasant movie but i think has a lot of heart to it and it's a really great takeaways i like this one quite a bit definitely a popular one people know this now we move to 1991's only yesterday written and directed by takahata this surprisingly became the number one film in japan in 1991 despite being another mature film from takahata a lot of adult audiences uh, gravitated towards this film and this is another one that took a while to be seen around the world. Didn't get its first English release until 2016. Um, this one, I think, it was more underrated, underseen in the Ghibli catalog. Certainly not one of the blockbusters um, in terms of the worldwide appeal, despite having success when it came out. And I like Only Yesterday a lot. I think it's um, really, really nice, really impressive. And I, I think it's also just quite fun because it's these two parallel tracks where we're with uh, Taito uh, when she's 27 years old, living in Tokyo alone uh, or single in uh, 1982. And we're flashing back to her time as a schoolgirl, like age 11-ish. And it's basically re- uh, reflecting on your past adolescence, your past coming of age. And as a result, those flashback scenes, there's a lot of, I think, really uh, common coming of age tropes, but they're done, I think, really well and effective here. You know, youthful romance, uh, puberty, um, the desire to participate in the school drama club, things like that. And it ultimately becomes a, f- a movie about um, memory, I think, and, and self, um, kind of like self motivation, like finding what you want to be in life. It's also, I think, underrated portrayal of gender roles where people keep asking her, Taito, if she wants to be married. She's single in her late 20s. Um, obviously, the flashback scenes. We have one of the all-time shitty television or, or film dads. Um, Taito's dad sucks. You know, uh, the way gender is portrayed, especially in those flashback scenes, I think is done pretty um, intelligently. And then once we get to... Um, kind of more the present day stuff, Tato leaves Tokyo, goes to visit some uh, family in a rural uh, Yamagata and comes to find that she's actually more at peace and more at home out there with a, perhaps a simpler, less busy life, but it seems to give her more worth and interest. And uh, She meets Toshio when she's there. Maybe there's a budding romance there. It's not really the point, though, of the movie. I think it's more about like what you want to be and how you want to go about 
that in your life. It's pretty um pretty I think it's sophisticated. Like it's it's definitely an adult film. Like it's this is definitely not one to show kids and there's probably not enough like wow stuff going on with this despite the uh flashbacks to, you know, being eleven. But yeah, I like this one quite a bit. This is the first film that Toshio Suzuki had like a lead producer credit on and he would follow up basically the entire run of Ghibli films from here on out and be one of the be like the producer on the films but yeah shout out only yesterday i think a definitely underrated ghibli entry just one year later 1992 we have porco rosso written and directed by hayao miyazaki the number one film in japan for 1992 this is one of my favorite ghibli movies i love it so much um probably the first the most overt for first really overt example of hayao's love of aviation hayao miyazaki came from a family uh, involved in the aviation business this really influenced of course the ghibli name which i believe is from a um italian airplane company or airplane model of some kind something like that and then porco rosso this is a film it's just a love letter to kind of the romanticized you know flyboy uh stuff that we had in hollywood uh in the past you know and I think this movie is an absolute blast where it's set in, you know, modern times. We're talking like, I think it's like 1929-ish, basically the interwar period between World War One, and World War II. Porco Rosso is a ace pilot who left the Italian Air Force to become a bounty hunter. Uh, you know, to quote him in the English dub, better be a pig than a fascist. That's a line has actually been used recently in Spanish politics, funny enough. Great line. And he says the word pig because Porco Rosso has been cursed with a pig's face. Uh, he, of course, was a human. And despite all that, man, it, it it's kind of like a rip-roaring like, Casablanca movie at times. Like There's like noir intrigue, and the I think the animation is so beautiful. The dogfights look great. The whole concept of like aquaplane seaplane pirates attacking uh shipping vessels and, and passengers then having this bounty hunter independent figure in porco protect the community and get paid as a result like it's a great great stuff and the conflict's really fun where porco um gets shot down and he has to basically sneak away to uh north you know he's in the mediterranean sneak away up north to milan and get a new plane and or get his plane repaired and while all that of course he left the italian air force so he is on the run from the italian secret police so there's a lot of uh, espionage and intrigue with that i really love the the movie theater scene he has where he talks with the police officer contact um and the rise of fascism in italy of course real thing that being like the specter of actual conflict in the movie i think is really cool because the person who shoots down porco in the beginning is a curtis this american pilot who's actually a real real life character a real life person and curtis is played as like this buffoon but he's not the real bad guy he just happens to be the antagonist of porco in the moment the real bad guy is of course the fascist takeover of italy funny enough and yeah i mean i think as it progresses it, it has a really awesome uh, i think use of female characters where all the mechanics making porco's new plane all women um Porco's love interest, uh, she kind of runs this like island hotel bed and breakfast bar haunt where like all the pirates hang out, all the other people like Porco hang out, and she's fixated on Porco. Like th there's just a romanticism to this movie. It feels really timeless to me. A lot of funny stuff too. Like I love the child hostages in the beginning jumping around the pirates who quote kidnap them. So funny. Um, Back when all the pirates are, they want to like go gang up on Porco in the beginning, and their quote like a line when they don't want to get shot down by this obviously ace pilot who's better than them is, uh, "My uh, plane has engine trouble." Is like the 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 bitching out line that's so funny when they when he returns to the Mediterranean towards the end of the movie, the ambush scene that the pirates uh, uh, ambush him at his hideout really fun. Um, the dog fight's fun. The, the fist fight that Porco has with uh, Curtis and this big, uh, you know, uh, to do after they have this fight. Like, that's really great. And um, ultimately, he doesn't have a fairy tale ending. Right? Porco doesn't, 
become human again, right? Like the setup for this being Beauty and the Beast was right there, but it doesn't happen. And despite all that, it doesn't feel any less um, effective as an ending or satisfying to the viewer because that's just not kind of what the movie was. The movie was, you know, telling you, Porco, yeah, he's a bit of a chauvinistic pig, literally, you know? But he had a heart, good heart in the end, and that's kind of what it was about. Funny enough, this movie was originally conceived as a short for Japan Airlines, and then Miyazaki ends up making it into a full-blown full blown movie. Um, I think this one's incredibly rewatchable, just has a really great charm to it, and as a result of it being about you know airplane dogfighting, it has a lot of fun uh, action to it, too. So I'm a big fan of Porco Rosso. Next up, we have 1993's Ocean Waves, known in Japan as I Can Hear the Sea. And Ocean Waves was directed by Tomomi Mochizuki. This is the first Ghibli film not directed by Takahata or Miyazaki, obviously. And this was conceived as a way for Ghibli to make something, have, his, have the younger staff at the studio make something, also you know, get them experience and whatnot, but also make something a bit cheaper. And despite all that, apparently this movie came in over budget and uh, late behind schedule, funny enough. But this movie ended up coming out on TV in Japan in 1993. And definitely as a result, was a bit of an under-remarked-upon entry in the Ghibli canon, for sure. Short film at only 72 minutes. The animation, I think, is nice, but it's more of a traditional, like almost like television anime uh, visual. You know, it doesn't quite stand out quite as much as some of the more f- uh, visual flair you expect from some of the big Ghibli films. And I think that's partially because this is just a film set you know, in, in in real life, you know, I believe we're in a Kochi, Japan, they go to Tokyo at some point, but just set in real life. And it's about a, a teenage love triangle. That's really what this film's about. You have uh, Tatu and uh, Yutaku, these two uh, friends, and they both kind of get ensnared by this uh, girl they encounter, uh, Rikako, Rikoko, Rikako, sorry. And in a sense, a lot of these characters are a bit it's stocky, a bit archetypical. It's a pretty brisk movie, so there's not a whole lot of depth to color in. Um, but I don't know. Like, I really enjoy like the mess of this love triangle. I think it's really enjoyable. Um, on one hand, there's like so many red flags with so many things going on in these relationships. But I thought it was a really fun watch, even if it's probably ultimately like an unspectacular um movie like there's nothing like amazing about what's going on but i found it incredibly entertaining um just kind of watching uh, everything go up and down the, the fights that happen the trip to tokyo is incredibly uh tough to watch as rikoko basically uses tattoo as a prop uh for you know her ex-boyfriend and yeah i found it pretty engaging there's one like notable like gratuitous shot of a female tennis player and her chest uh, bouncing behind a t-shirt and it's like they couldn't help but get the horny anime shot in there like that's nowhere else in ghibli but somehow these this film has something like that that you associate with anime generally Uh, like that really stood out to me when i saw it i was like wow can't believe you have this in here um yeah i think ocean waves like pretty solid like by the end like when they have the uh the gathering of a lot of students at like out to eat towards the end like i thought it was pretty fun and yeah i like ocean waves probably a bit of a hot take it's not too popular but i thought it was pretty solid honestly next up we have 1994's palm poco written and directed by isio takahara number one film in japan in 94 and this one is quite fun a quirky film this is about anthropomorphic raccoons who due to the expansion of human development outside tokyo these raccoons must fight for the survival of the forest they live in and protecting their their community and 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 their lives and of course a classic very familiar example of environmentalism in a ghibli film but this one film uh has a lot of i think quirks to it you know set in like the 60s 70s time when uh, the tama hills development is happening outside tokyo and all this forest clearing is happening and these raccoons uh, have to fight back and you know this is a movie that i enjoy i think it's a bit too long it's over two hours it has a lot of narration which i felt was a bit distracting and makes it come across as underwritten 
Um, it never quite becomes the like guerrilla war movie I wanted it to be, where the raccoons are just fucking with humans and stuff. It has parts of that, whether they're being more violent or just being like really like devious and like like scaring humans and stuff because these raccoons have powers where they can uh, manipulate their 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 bodies and, and do great things. I wish it was more of that, to be honest. It kind of gets away from that and gets a bit repetitive at the end of Act 2 and the Act 3. Um, you know, we get introduced to these Fox characters who have found their own ways to um, ingratiate themselves to human society to survive. And the transformation stuff is fun. I think what's kind of interesting is, like, there's not really, like, a true, like, lead protagonist in this movie, but there's a lot of, like, supporting characters. And there's some quirky stuff, some fun visuals, um... At one point, the raccoons literally use their, like, testicles to, like, curb stomp. It's really funny. Um, I wish it was, like, a little different. Like, the outfit was, like, wound slightly like, a different way. But it's still pretty enjoyable, pretty fun. Um, and because, again, at the end of the day, it's a classic story, right? It's, like, these underdogs trying to fight back any way they can to survive. And really fits in the Ghibli worldview so like i think pompoko is fun it's a good watch i just think it probably could have been a lot better it could have been a special movie if it was done a little bit differently but for what it is it has some really fun elements to it so shout out pompoko next up we have 1995's whisper of the heart directed by yoshifumi kondo and this ended up being the only film kondo directed for studio ghibli because he unfortunately tragically passed away in 1998 at the age of only 47 um, he was largely talked about as kind of an heir apparent to Miyazaki and Takahata. So very sad, you know, what could have been type thing. But Whisper of the Heart, which was the number one film in Japan in 95, like many of these Ghibli films will now be at that point if you haven't caught on. Uh, this is an interesting one where, uh, on one hand, like it's a film that, and this was, it was written by Miyazaki, even though he didn't direct. This is one where, on one hand, it doesn't have a whole lot of conflict for a lot of the story. And it's really just set in, for the most part, it's super grounded. And it's just kind of set in, you know, a story of coming of age and adolescence. Once again, again, some familiar stuff uh, with Chibli. Our lead, uh, Shizuku, she is a, you know, junior high kid who like likes to read and write. And she encounters uh, this young boy, Seiji, who is a aspiring uh, violin craftsman. And... They eventually, you know, kind of hit it off together. And what's so funny about this movie, you know, you have this songwriter and this violin craftsman coming together. What's so funny about this movie is a key aspect of the story is John Denver's, of course, famous smash hit, Country Roads, a song that world-renowned, it's been covered by hundreds of artists. People know the song. And uh, Shizuku is, like, tasked with, like, writing, like, new lyrics to the song. And it's so funny how her and Seiji kind of like make fun of the lyrics and talk about the song. I, I, I just, it was so funny, especially now, like watching the movie Whisper of the Heart, knowing how still present Country Roads is as a song in, in just general culture. I thought it was really funny that it had such an integral part uh, to the, the core of the plot here. Um, of course, uh, Shizuku, in one of her moments, doing the writing with the headphones on, with the pencil, the clear inspiration for lo-fi hip-hop girl on YouTube, if you know, you know. Um, Whisper of the Heart, ultimately, I think the lesson is really nice. It's another good one to show kids because it's really about, I think, pushing yourself and motivating yourself and, and put, finding out why you want to do what you do and why you want to find that success. And, you know, I think that's a really nice kind of lesson of course there's teen angst in this of course there's other coming of age stuff but like the core core beat of it i think is a nice like like sub genre of studio ghibli like lessons and takeaways you know um to me it's not like a special ghibli movie i think some people really ride for it i certainly am not at that level i think it's solid i think it's good but compared to some of the other ones i have this a bit lower um, and that's kind of how the Ghibli filmography goes, where there's very few of these movies you'd call bad or even close to bad, but the bar is very high, you know, when you have some of the greatness that we've got with this franchise, uh, this this you know filmography, the studio. Whisper of the Heart also ended up having a spinoff film 
a few years later uh, called The Cat Returns, which I'll get to, based off um, The Baron, which was the name of this uh, cat uh, figure in the film. And there's some fantastical elements to Whisper of the Heart at the end. You know, the poster has uh, Suzuku and you know, the red coat on the broom. That's a brief, like, you know, dream sequence. It's not really that kind of movie, you know? Like, so I think some people like, would probably, at the time, saw that poster and they're like, oh my god, it's like Kiki's Livery Service again, let's go. It's not really that kind of movie. I guess thematically it's similar. But it doesn't have as overtly, like, magical stuff as Kiki flying on the broom. But Whisper of the Heart, I know this one has a lot of fans. It's actually, um, it's been adapted into live action as well. This is not the only version of it. But uh, yeah, that's Whisper of the Heart, 95. At last, we've made it. 1997, Princess Mononoke, the number one film in Japan in 97, the number one film in Japan of all time at the time. Princess Mononoke is the most epic film Ghibli has made. Massive scale, massive conflict, massive violence, massive blood. This is the the most violent film Ghibli has made. It was their first PG-13 movie when it came out. And this was a, of course, ma- this had a massive hit uh, in Japan, and it's a complete masterpiece. Um, I absolutely love this movie. This is something that really captivated me when I first saw the visuals for it, um, you know, back in the day. And, man, I think it, it's special for so many reasons. Um, I think people know this is one of the most popular uh, Ghibli films. This is also a movie that, um, you know, did big in Japan, had a pretty um, unsuccessful North American release, but ultimately became the bridge for Japanese films in a certain sense, finding future box office success in the United States, and also made, you know, 250 plus million additional home video revenue off DVDs, uh, sold 4.54 million DVDs by 2007. Um, This is a film that is probably the most famous example of Ghibli's relationship uh, with Disney, in terms of getting North American distribution and dubbing. Uh, Neil Gaiman famously handled the English dub of this film and also helped protect this movie from Harvey Weinstein, who was you know, overseeing the distribution of the film at Miramax. Harvey wanted to cut this movie up. It's long. He wanted to cut, make it shorter. Um, Ghibli allegedly famously sent a samurai sword to Miramax with a note that said no cuts. Ghibli is very protective of the versions of the movies that they make. Anyway, yeah, this is an epic movie, violent, dark, but still has all the Ghibli themes that we love. It's about environmentalism. It is about, also about loss. You know, this is a movie that when it ends, both sides have taken heavy losses. There is not a lot to necessarily feel great about at the end, even if both sides have kind of agreed to uh, let the other be. Um it's also so epic and still because it's literally about gods and demons. You know, the English dub, you have Keith David as the narrator. You know how great of a voice he has. So excellent. And yeah, I think just kind of the story as it goes where you have uh, Prince Ashitaka of the Amishi people. He, I mean, the opening set piece with like the demon boar. Um, amazing. And then uh, Ashitaka, he gets cursed and he's afflicted and he has to go to a faraway land and try and you know, try and save himself, and as a result, he gets really absorbed in this conflict between Iron Town, these humans, uh, human community, really using the natural resources of the forest and really pillaging in a certain sense, and their conflict with the forest and those within. Um, it's this huge, epic conflict, and Ashitaka comes to this conflict and can see both sides of it. And he was coming through solely personal means too. I think there's so much depth to this film and, you know, where it goes, you know, I think it's really great where, again, this is one where um, I think uh, loneliness and going to a new place that Ashitaka does familiar theme, right? It's another Ghibli film that doesn't have true bad guys where Iron Town is positioned as bad in a certain sense, but Lady Eboshi, the lead of, Iron Town. She has good intentions more often than not. She's protecting her people, and her people are formal brothel girls and and lepers. You know, she is well intentioned, and you know uh, the conflict you have, of course, uh, San. You know, the titular princess Mononoke, who is uh, a young woman who's raised by wolves and um, hates the humans and what they do to the forest. As a result, like I think it's just such an epic 
conflict, right? And like where it goes, where you have uh, the spirit of the forest. Um, what happens to the spirit, I think, is so so kind of moving, right? And this is a movie that has so many unique visuals, whether it's Ashitaka's um, elk mount, of course, uh, San riding the big white wolf, um, the spirit with his human face really sticks in your mind. Um, the Iron Town people with their very primitive firearms, I thought, really stood out. Everything that happens with the boars, um, the uh, what's it called, the ape tribe, and how kind of um, opaque and mysterious they are. They, you know, they can't be reasoned, but they're also hard to see when they're way they're animated. When the spirit becomes the Night Walker at the end, like um, the way Ashitaka, when he kind of like uses his curse pet curse for power and catches arrows and you know decapitates people or, or, or removes their arms with his fire firing back like it's pretty epic man and i think what, what, what makes you sit with it is just again the, the those environmental themes that you really sit with because it's like you want to like make things stop but you understand like why people feel the way they do and ashitaka doesn't like get with san at the end san goes back into the forest you know ashitaka agrees to help iron town rebuild and like it's not what you thought it would be you know after all this loss i don't know it's one that i think really sticks with me um again cameron said this as an influence this is a movie that i th- i think it's just really special really rewards uh repeat viewing the visuals alone just back it up. Even if you don't, want, you want to watch it more casually. I think it's really great. This was the first uh, animated film to win the Japan Academy Prize, you know, the, their top film award, and largely celebrated as I think one of the greatest animated films ever, just because of how I think sophisticated it is, despite quote being animated. You know, um, and I should have said this was made by uh, Hayao, and uh, yeah, I, I, I mean. I think there's very little in this movie that doesn't work. It's also incredible world building. You know, there's 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 an emperor that gets name dropped in this movie. We don't see him. It's not what this movie's about, but he's there. You know, like there's I think the cultural resonance of the the, the peoples you see really stands out. Uh, there, there's so much to Mononoke. Okay. There's a lot of additional scholarship that you should look into about it. It's a really special movie. Next, we have 1999's My Neighbors, The Yamadas, uh, written and directed by Takahata. And this is definitely a unique Ghibli film because it's a clear visual departure from the animation we expect. It's actually a comic strip style of animation. And it's very, I think, kind of vague and not super detailed in what it's animating and what it's not. And to me, this one doesn't work for me. Some people like it. It's like broadly well-received. But it didn't work for me. I think partially the visuals just really took me out. I didn't like the animation style. Um, not so much that it was different, but just so that I, I thought it was pretty opaque. Like, it's it's washed out. It's supposed to be kind of memoristic, but I just couldn't get into it. Also, the storytelling, it's really just kind of a series of vignettes about suburban family life. And it's based on a manga. And uh, it was just kind of mundane to me. I also thought that parental figures in the film had some really annoying personality traits and some of the stuff with the kids are fun you know some vignettes work better than others and a bit sentimental the way it ends but i don't know this one i mean to follow up princess mononoke with this um and you know you know what's coming next after this as well like i don't know this feels like the definition of a minor ghibli work like i just i just don't think there's a lot lot to it and um like it's not egregious but to have this be the movie that comes out between mononoke and spirited away like uh, you don't have to i think spend too much time thinking about it to be honest and uh it's clearly the 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 least significant of the takahata uh ghibli films that he made all right so that takes us 2001 spirited away once again written and directed by hayao miyazaki man Talk about a heater. Princess Mononoke. Four years later, spirited away. Up there for one-two punches, one-two runs in director history, for sure. 
uh, Spirited Away, to many, the greatest uh, Ghibli film, incredibly popular, incredibly influential, uh, so much so that this is probably the signature breakthrough moment with Ghibli in the West. As much as Mononoke got a lot of the early credit, Spirited Away actually like put up the, the numbers, you know, highest grossing Japanese film of all time at the time, $395 million, held that record for 17-ish years until Demon Slayer came out just a few years ago to beat that, and that was off only a $19 million budget, huge hit, Uh, also winning the Academy Award, winning the Oscar for Best Animated Feature, the only hand-drawn animated film to do so, and the only non-English language winner to do so. Uh, or, you know, or before that, of course, it was the first animated film to win the Golden Bear at the Berlin uh, Film Festival. And just recently, in 2022, the new version of the Sight and Sound Pulse, Spirited Away, number 75 all time and the greatest films of all time. So much pedigree, so much clout, so much admiration for this film. And yeah, I think for an incredibly good reason. Spirited Away is fantastic and it's there's so there's so much to it which which i think makes it so special you know in a sense the the core plot you could say is is straightforward you have this young girl uh chichiro her parents get turned into uh pigs basically and she gets effectively trapped at this uh bathhouse for spirits and she must find a way to escape must find a way to turn her parents back to humans, human form, and escape, and return, you know, return to actual life. And if not, she'll be stuck in the spirit world. And despite all that, like, this bathhouse, one of the great creations in, like, you know, animated film history, I would say. So much to it, so much visual flair, so much, so many different types of characters, all the different spirits, the workers at the bathhouse. There's so much going on. It's such a lifelike and lush way and that i think makes it it's such a such so ripe with wonder you know there's these notable um set pieces quote unquote for spirited away where you have uh, the uh the i forgot what it's named the uh the 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 spirit who smells who uh all the the uh workers are really frustrated that he showed up that whole sequence you have, of course, no no face uh, who gets let in by Chichiro, and then kind of starts terrorizing the bathhouse. Of course, uh, Yubaba, the the witch, the the quote the quote bad guy of the film, running the bathhouse and the fear of her. Um, the, the stuff in the boiler room with the soot spirits. Um, of course, Haku, the human boy, who who we meet, who help agrees to help. Chichiro Escape. Um, it's such an awesome fable, and it, it's just stuffed with so much stuff. So much. Sometimes it's weird. Like, I, I think I just love how much is here, and like the relationship between Chichiro and Haku is, I think, pretty interesting. Of course, learning Haku has a dragon form as well. Just this crazy like left field moment, like uh, two thirds of the movie. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so much of the design is so awesome and i think it's the core conceit of making sure you don't forget your name so you can in fact escape uh yubaba's uh like twin sister um i think has comes in a nice way um the the big baby uh from yubaba like there's so many elements to this movie and they all kind of serve the greater purpose which is um you know she shows desire to uh maintain her you know, independence and, and, and free your family, but also a genuine uh, affection for Haku. Maybe it's Stockholm Syndrome. I don't, I don't know, but I think it's just really enjoyable. Another one that really rewards uh, repeat viewing, but it's really unlike anything else in the Ghibli catalog. There are movies that um, maybe you could try and compare it, but I just think there's, there's so much going on with Spirit Away in the most beautiful way that it's hard to really compare it to anything else. Um, the and like i guess like in terms of like the inspiration you know these um kami shinto spirits it just it's realized in such a, a beautiful way you know 
uh, John Lasseter, of course, formerly of Pixar, had convinced Disney to buy the North American distribution for this and helped oversee the English dub. It's one of the more widely widely uh, celebrated English dubs of a Ghibli movie where the, the voice acting really fits the tone of the original text and even the uh, dub line deliveries match the mouth movements of the animation. So like um, so much care put into that, which is of course what you want to see, you know, kind of post the Weinstein issue with Ghibli. That's nice that Lasseter, who was a, a friend and peer of Miyazaki, of course, was so involved. Uh, yeah, this is, this is one of the great ones for sure. And then following that up, of course, we have none other than 2002's The Cat Returns. So 2002's The Cat Returns, directed by Hiroki Morita, his only film for Ghibli. And from what I understand, Morita was not involved with Ghibli for super long either. This is kind of an oddball, where this is a film that's a spin-off of Whisper of the Heart, featuring the Baron character, this minor element of Whisper of the Heart. And it's actually just a movie uh, about cats in all in all on all manners, right? This girl saves a cat from being uh, run over by a car, and thus we learn about this cat society that humanity is unbeknownst to them, and we kind of go through that. You know, it's only seventy five minutes, pretty short. Originally commissioned as like a cat short for a theme park. Another one was like testing ground type films. I didn't love the animation quality of this it's a bit different um yeah i mean the cat the cat parade early on is pretty amusing the cat king having like secret service was pretty funny and the cat kingdom concept and the prince it's all fine um but i think this one it just kind of is what it is as a movie maybe a bit juvenile um, the last half, I guess, is enjoyable enough, but I, I think it, it's definitely like a minor Ghibli work for sure. There's nothing too special about it. Um, definitely hilarious that Mononoke gets followed up with My Neighbor Stiyamata's and Spirit Away gets followed up with The Cat Returns. Definitely odd in terms of momentum, even if they weren't, they certainly weren't treated the same way, of course, but alas. Any feeling about The Cat Returns, of course, is quickly lost once the next film comes out, 2004's Howl's Moving Castle. So Howl's Moving Castle, Miyazaki's follow-up to Spirited Away. I've seen a lot of attention on this one. One of the top grocers. Um, this got an Oscar nom, did not win. And notable, actually, because this was supposed to be, or originally was going to be directed by Momoro Hosada, who obviously is a very significant anime film director at this time was really coming off some early Digimon work, but he's pretty celebrated now. Recently gave us Bell, one of the, I think, more interesting uh, anime auteurs these days. And Hosada was actually like fired or like left the Ghibli project because he just didn't quite see eye to eye with the strict creative vision that Ghibli wants to put on stuff. So Miyazaki ends up doing it himself. And this is definitely one of the more popular films for sure. For me, I don't have it quite on the same tier as like the all-time greats. I have it like the next grouping down, just because I think a lot of the stuff in Howl's Moving Castle is great and done very well, but some of it's a bit familiar or a bit um, reminiscent of some of the past Ghibli hits. And of course, that's going to be a theme that continues when you um, continue to do what you do. You know, of course, we talk about this with Pixar as well. Um, but having said, Howl's Moving Castle, you know, um, this girl, Sophie, who... Um, bit of an outcast and ends up being like this kind of beans of being a romance with this roguish vain cocky uh man sometimes bird man how in his delectable moving literally moving castle is moving home you know fueled by this fire spirit which in the english dub is voiced amazingly by billy crystal and you have these amazing ghibli visuals especially with the moving castle you have, uh, I think, really memorable characters. Hal's certainly a memorable character, especially the visuals of him, but also just, I think, his personality, his moodiness uh, really stands out. You have a true villain in a Ghibli movie, not super common, The Witch of the Waste in this. Sophie's journey, I think, is really paid off well in terms of what she wants, what kind of character she is, and being like an actualized person, not just solely lusting after or 
seeking the support from Hal, you know, and also just a really good time, you know. Um, I, I think that the kind of the magical elements of it and how that's presented is all really enjoyable, really awesome, and it's 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 incredibly grand, you know. Um, so even if it's like thematically a bit similar to some of the other hits, like the visual flair of this is so awesome, and um, I think it's a really satisfying watch. So How's Moving Castle is still an absolute banger. Big fan of it. And from there, that leads us to, I would say now, we're, I would say from this point forward, we're approaching like, quote, a late period Ghibli. I mean, the next film was 06. It's a while ago at this point. But I feel like we're at least leaving the golden years at this point. And that would begin with 2006 Tales from Earthsea. So 2006 Tales from Earthsea which is an adaptation of some novels. This is the directorial debut from Goro Miyazaki, the son of Hayao Miyazaki. Tales from Earthsea, when it came out, was incredibly maligned. I would say it's the most maligned Ghibli film at the time. Even to this day, it's bottom two or three, you know, consensus-wise. Not well-liked. Goro caught a lot of flack for this. In a sense, I would chalk that up to some inexperience, What's disappointing about Tales from Earthsea to me, which I didn't really care for, is it looks like it has all the pieces. The visuals, the animation really stand out. Some early world building really attracts you to the story, reminiscent of how Mononoke goes. We're clearly in this big world with uh, a lot of backstory, and now we're going to focus on this small piece. It really tantalizes you, sucks you in. And... Um, you know, there's some, I think, just awesome visuals. Like, the stuff in, like, the, the city early on, like the bustling streets and stuff. I was like, I love that stuff. Really, I want all that. And the problem with Tales of Mercy is it just doesn't really make any sense. It's a hard conflict to follow. The villain is is quite rote. Um, a true villain, for sure, in this one is quite rote. You have, like, the dragons coming at the end, which are all over the marketing. And, like, they just don't land at all. Like, it's just a big misfire in terms of the script is very weak. And I, I can't speak to how much of that's the problem with the adaptation or not, but it's just, it doesn't really have enough under the hood, especially for what we expect from a Ghibli film. Once, you know, we have a high floor and a high standard for such. So it's, uh, to me, like it's just quite disappointing that it's because like it, it wanted to be a grand movie. This wanted to be a big Ghibli film. And, it, there was just nothing to it, you know? So even if some parts of it are nice to look at and fun, it, you know, there, there, this is not a lot here. So tough going for Goro. He made, he'll make a few more, which we're about to get to. But uh, yeah, that's Tales from Mercy, followed up in 2008 by Ponyo. So 2008, we have Ponyo, written and directed by Hayao Miyazaki, uh, you know, his follow-up to Howl's Moving Castle. And it's a quite the change of pace. You think about Hayao's you know, output to this point. Mononoke, Spirit Away, Howl's Moving Castle, back to back to back. Three big, grand, beautiful films. All adored. Ponyo is very well liked, but it's a lot smaller in scope. It's very kind. It's very nice. This is a great one for young kids. Uh, to me, it's Hayo's least successful film. I think it's good but it, it, it's definitely my least favorite of his. And I think part of that is it's just a bit, it's a bit svelte. It's a bit, a bit, a bit simple to me. You know, the story of Ponyo, this goldfish who leaves the ocean and is helped by this boy, Sosuke. And, you know, it's okay. Um, it's another, I think, pretty fun villain where it's like not truly a villain. It's, you know, it's under, under the sea guy and, there's some fun stuff with the weather when they're driving around in like the hur the hurricane monsoon typhoon type thing. Um, it's all nice, it's all sweet, um, but to me, like that's kind of all it was. Like the animation is nice, but it was just a bit small in scope to me. It didn't quite have enough wonder. I think if it spent more time under the sea, it'd be pretty fun. Like I think when Ponyo escapes and like all the other goldfish are down like in the the uh quote bad guys like lair right like that was pretty fun that was that was awesome visuals but a lot of stuff above ground it's a bit less spectacular to me um solid movie you know i'm mean, glad i watched it type thing 
But yeah, to me, it's Hayo's like less least impactful film, which again it speaks to just how high a bar we have for him. But uh, yeah, Ponyo, it's all right. Um, from there we have 2010's Arietti. So Arietti from 2010, um, English title, The Secret World of Arietti. This is directed by Hiromasa Yonbayashi, his directorial debut. And Yonbayashi's Arietti stands out quite quickly for the animation. Absolute top-notch, gorgeous animation, classic Ghibli vibe, right? And this is a film that I think quite quickly tells you that this wants to bring you back to the grandeur of some of those Ghibli hits. And it certainly does. This is an adaptation of the borrower's story. So, you know, the story of Arietti, this little person, very little person and her family living within this home of full-size real humans. And I think there's some amazing visuals, the perspective you get from big people and, and, and these very little people, these bar, you know, these borrower people walking through the walls, jumping across nails and stuff. That's all amazing. That's all so good. You know, I think the the tension for Ariadne wants to speak to this this uh, you know sick boy who's in the home they live in and make a connection because she's lonely. She only knows her parents, and you know, it's it's very relatable, familiar for a Ghibli film for sure, but it's a great conflict. And even if like the whole conflict is a smaller stakes, quote unquote. It's great because even though we're confined to basically this one home the entire time, it feels so much bigger because Arietti, of course, herself is so small. So, you know, I think the story itself maybe is lacking in like, like any extra depth beyond what that is. But I think it's just very well executed on. Um, and again, that, that first borrowing sequence I think is really special, really great. Um, and just Arietti and Sam, the sick boy, just them being like the lonely spirits that they are, I think just uh, kindred spirits because they're lonely and isolated, which is really, really nice, you know, and then the caretaker becoming like the villain at the very end, that doesn't quite land enough, you know, I, it would, maybe you could have done some bigger set piece with the pest control people at the end, but overall, I think it, it it's quite fun. Uh, this notably... Uh, Ohio script, even though I didn't direct, um, 149 million worldwide, but 18.8 in the U.S., making it the highest-grossing Ghibli film in the United States, and the 15th highest-grossing Japanese film worldwide, fifth highest-grossing Ghibli film worldwide. So, very successful. And I think even if it's clearly like not a top-tier Ghibli film, there's a lot of love for this. I think that's just the uh, relatability of the character motivations, the gorgeous animation, and just kind of the fun set pieces. So, shout out Arietti. Uh, Yonbayashi would direct one more film for Ghibli before spinning off and making uh, Studio Ponic uh, in the years to follow. And then from there, just one year later, after Arietti, we have 2011's From Up on Poppy Hill, Goro Miyazaki's second film. So 2011's From Up on Poppy Hill, Goro's second film after Tales from Earthsea, this is pretty solid. I say this is the best Goro Miyazaki film. You know, set in a post-war Yokohama, 1964. It's a small story, and I think that's probably the biggest criticism to it is there's not a lot going on with this film, which is kind of a nice story. Not grand, not deep per se, but, you know, enjoyable. I think the, um, you know, our, our two leads, they're... Budding romance is really fun and nice, and the best thing about it is just everyone at their school, the boys, the girls, rallying to save this, like, school clubhouse building from being destroyed. That is the core, like, conflict with this. Obviously, there's some familial stuff between both characters and their um, bonds that they share. Over that, there's some, there's a really big twist in From Up on Poppy Hill that I certainly did not see coming. Um, obviously, it's, a, it's an old movie. I'll spoil it. Um, they hint at incest in this movie where these characters learn they're related. So funny. Um, incest scare, you could say. Um, 
but yeah, just everything about saving the Latin Quarter, saving that clubhouse, I think that's really fun. There's this moment where there's the students are having this debate, and the teachers come in and they to cover cover what they're doing. This big yelling, they all just bust out into song to cover themselves. I thought that was like really, really funny. This is a total minor work from Ghibli, but I think it's completely watchable, completely fun, and and nails what it's trying to do. It's just it's just small in scope, small in ambition but pretty solid, you know, and I think it's certainly it's shown a nice sign of growth from Goro that by making it a, a smaller scale story, this one has no magic at all. It's literally just set in the past doing that and just kind of telling a story. He proved that he could do something like that. Unfortunately, his next film, which I'll get to, uh, had some sins, but yeah, from up on Poppy Hill, solid, honestly. It's okay. And then from there, we have 2013's The Wind Rises. So 2013's The Wind Rises, this was the final Hayao Miyazaki film written and directed by him, uh, of course, until The Boy and the Heron was announced. But for a while, this was the swan song of Hayao. This was his final film. And The Wind Rises, like Porco Rosso before it, is the total ode and nod to Miyazaki's love for aviation. And The Wind Rises is awesome for, again, being a completely grounded, normal film. You know, there's some dream sequences going on, but there's no magic to this. It's set in the past, the lead up to uh, World War II. Our lead character is none other than uh, Jiro Horikoshi, who ends up, is a real person, who ends up becoming one of the chief aviation designers in Japan and developing the technology for the Japanese Zero, the fighter plane that, of course, was so big in World War II. And in the lead-up to this, of course, he's experienced the great Tokyo earthquake, amazing sequence uh, in this film, and then you know, the economic downturn before World War II, leading to World War II. Um, all this stuff where you see Jiro visualize his airplane designs and just truly being a genius that's all really cool and i think ultimately what makes this such a poignant film from miyazaki and a fitting retirement film when it was still that was that clearly the movie grapples with when you're an artist in this case a designer of airplanes right when you're an artist you can't control what happens to your art of course jiro's designing planes in the empire of japan right? They flash forward to the end of the war, kind of skip over the war itself, but they flash forward to the end of the war and there's all this regret of things wasted, right? And even though he had all these great designs, he was able to achieve his dreams, it was used in an ill-begotten way, of course, you know, in World War II. And uh, it's, I think it's a pretty moving thing. Of course, there's some fictional, fictionalized stuff about the Jiro story here. Um, you know, you the love interest who is sick, um, what happens with her, I think, is very um, touching in terms of her decisions. Um, it, it's fun to see Jiro interact with the Germans and the Nazis, uh, you know, before the war. In terms of them, that was a Dr. Junkus, the uh, German plane designer. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, what was it? Werner Herzog was the voice as well, which is really cool. And uh, my guy Hideyotoshi Nishijima was uh, the voice in a... In, uh, from the Japanese side of thing, I love him. So yeah, I think this is um, it's pretty nice. I think my only gripe is I didn't really care so much for the dream sequence scenes. You have um the Italian aviation designer uh, Caprioni, another real person. He's kind of factoring in there. Like I would have liked it if it was a bit more like strictly historical, just from the storytelling perspective. But I think it's a touching film. It's a moving film. It's still gorgeously animated. You know, even if it doesn't quite have the flair of Porco Rosso. You know, we're, not, we're not watching the dog fights. But some of like the test sequences when the planes take off, when they succeed or don't succeed, that's all pretty compelling. And just it's clearly it has a love for aviation, the design of aircraft, and you know, the Falcon flight test scene, for example. Um, yeah, so I think it's it's pretty pretty compelling for sure. Uh, this is the 2013's number one film in Japan, got an Oscar nom uh, as well. And was a fitting, uh, you know, send-off for Ohio. I think no one would have felt there was anything left to say. And now we have the boy and the heron. Um, I don't know 
people like it. I haven't seen it, of course, yet. I'll be reviewing it soon when I get the English release. But yeah, uh, that was, for a while, Hayao's last film. And then this very same year, we got Takahata's last film with The Tale of Princess Kaguya. All right, so we have 2013's The Tale of Princess Kaguya, the final film from Takahata, who would pass away a few years later. This film releasing very in quick succession with The Wind Rises. At the time, Miyazaki and Takahata basically releasing their final films at the same time. Obviously, that was not the case with Hayao. But uh, The Tale of Princess Kaguya is very widely celebrated. Oscar nom, complete critical adoration when it came out. And obviously got a lot of attention when it came out because Takahata hadn't released a film in almost 15 years. You know, My Neighbors, The Yamadas, was the last one. So it had been a minute from him. And I think what stands out so much about it right away from the very beginning is the animation style. You know, it's this very much this charcoal and watercolors type uh, style approach to the animation where a lot of the background is white. But then when we see our subjects in color, it's so, so vivid and really stands out and communicates a lot. Whereas for me, I thought the washed out nature of the Yamada's comic style strip animation didn't work for me. Kaguya is so much different, so much better, just so rich. And, and this is adapted from a, I believe, like 10th century like Japanese folk tale. Um, what's it called? The, uh, the Tale of the Bamboo Cutter. And has a pretty simple start and premise where this bamboo cutter, this, this man, he basically stumbles across this like glowing stalk of bamboo and inside he finds this little uh baby girl who quickly develops very quickly into uh you know adole- a toddler into young adolescence in the matter of days and the bamboo cutter adopts this uh little girl with his wife and they kind of bestow her uh this like title of a princess and there's just something about her something that enamored they're enamored with her and you know, meanwhile, the girl just wants to, you know, be a kid, you know, hang out with the village kids around, around town, and just be young, you know, be youthful, and I think uh, what, what's really getting into the, th- the themes of this film is, you know, the, the father, adoptive father, he sees what he has in hit this girl, and brings her to like the capital or at least bring brings her to civilization and has this kind of lust about him where he wants to raise his daughter uh in like high society and get her accepted and teach her the ways of being a like landed uh princess and he, him and his family can profit off it as a result that's never overtly said but you can clearly see the uh, lust and greed that's motivating this and we have this naming ceremony where the princess is dubbed princess kaguya and quickly there's this cult of personality around her where no one has seen her but the tales of her beauty have gone throughout the land and there's countless gentlemen suitors trying to take her hand right and throughout all of this kaguya does not want to do any of this she does not want to paint her teeth black and uh, pluck her eyebrows and uh, never go outside and just be a quote like real princess she doesn't want any of it and yet she finds her ways to uh i want to say fight back it's not that overtly uh, uh open conflict but her ways to um push push back on what's trying to be forced upon her uh you know it's just a naturally rebellious streak and I think the movie gets quite fun when um, these five like high-born, like lordly men all decide that they want Kaguya's hand, you know, racing to meet her in her mansion, and that provides some nice humor. But um, I think what's really great about this film, though, is like I think the ending, the last twenty minutes or so, is really spectacular, very moving, and the kind of the journey that happens with Kaguya, where you might have had a semblance of what would happen given that she was such a fast um, grower. She was supernatural. She's not from the earth, right? You you understand, like, there's another shooter dropping, and I wasn't quite sure exactly what was going to happen when I saw it, but I think it's a very effective 
ending, you know, the relationship that Kaguyu has with one of the uh, boys from the village, uh, Stamaru. When they reconnect over the years, I think that really lands. Um, yeah, and again, the animation, just like that watercolor style really grabs you. Um, and there's a brief moment towards the beginning where a very emotional moment happens to Kaguya and the animation really flips. It's like a total switch up and it gets almost melts away into this more like sketched out, um, rough, rougher animation um, to fit the dream sequence. And I think that was like really spellbinding. Um, this is actually funny enough, the most expensive Japanese film of all time at 49.3 million, uh, which is so funny to consider because most of the Ghibli staff at the time was working on The Wind Rises, which is more traditional hand-drawn Ghibli animation that you think of, right? Um, and yet this one really ran out the cost. There's actually a documentary about Takahata and the making of this film as well. Um, but it's definitely up there for me. I think it stands out for its uniqueness with the visuals, but also has, I think, a simple yet sophisticated way it tells its story and... Uh, is a true gem. You know, it lost the Oscar to Big Hero 6 back back in the day. I don't think that one's aged too well. Just like Howl's Moving Castle lost the Oscar to Wallace and Gromit, that one definitely has not aged too well. Alas, Tale of Princess Kaguya, a gem. And after the Tale of Princess Kaguya, we have 2014's When Marnie Was There, Hiromasa Yonbayashi's follow-up to Arietti and his last film for Studio Ghibli before breaking off to make Studio Panic. And when Marnie was there, you know, for a while was like the last Ghibli film. The follow-up to this, Earwig and the Witch, is six years later in 2020. Um, this felt like it was kind of the the swan song for the studio. Because again, Hayao was retired. Uh, Takahata had passed away. So it kind of felt like, or Takahata hadn't passed away yet, but he would be. But he had retired, you know, just like um, Hayao. And this kind of felt like for a while it was it. And I think the animation quality, the detail of the color, really awesome. Probably some of the best narration that we've gotten in a Ghibli film as well. That was a criticism of me at Paul and Poco, not the case when Marnie was there. Um, you know, we're set on um, kind of like rural Hokkaido, uh, Japan, for this one. And you have Anna, this quiet, reserved character. Doesn't really connect with people. Sent her aunt and uncles in the countryside of Hokkaido, and it's filmed you know, kind of in anxiety and like self doubt, and she has this fascination with this marsh house across the like uh, the bay from where she's staying, and she meets Marnie, uh, this this other girl, and you know for a while, you're kind of wondering like what like when the shoe's gonna drop what's the twist to this movie what's going on because things don't quite add up in terms of how they interact with each other what happens what doesn't happen so for me i thought for a while that she was just an imaginary friend um you know it, you know is she is she a ghost you know you start to change your mind on stuff there ends up being a kind of romantic like subset almost like i don't want to say queer bait but there's like people start shipping Marnie and Anna when it's uh, going through it. And then you have the twist ending uh, regarding some familial bonds, we'll say. Definitely didn't see the twist coming. <laughs> I know some people really love this twist. I don't know. For me, I just I don't think I was a quite like riding with the movie enough for it to totally land with me. Definitely didn't see it coming, but I think I just, to that point, I thought, like, oh, this is solid, but it hadn't totally grabbed me. You know, and there's a nice ending montage, I suppose. But yeah, I mean, I think it looks nice and it's definitely different. You know, it's definitely not like any other Ghibli film. I find it admirable for that. It didn't totally grab me, but I think it, it's certainly worthy. Um, but yeah, from here, uh, Yuen Bayashi, he would leave Ghibli and found Studio Ponic. And Studio Ponic would debut uh, Mary and the Witch's Flower in 2017, which had a lot of... Uh, Ghibli hallmarks, you could say. On one hand, maybe it would have been cool if Yonbayashi stayed with Ghibli and helped continue that legacy post Miyazaki, post Takahata. But, you know, at least he's out there working. You know, he wasn't the only one, of course, to leave. Um, I believe some, of the, some producers left with him as well, didn't make the new studio. So, 
it, not all is lost. And I think, you know, of course, he's not the only one doing this. Of course, um, Momoru Hosada, post Howl's Moving Castle, had um, has had quite the vivid career at this point. Uh, Hideki Ano, people know him, very, very prolific. And of course, Makoto Shinkai, who's like the anime goat right now, um, you know, with your name, Weathering With You, and this year's Suzume. Um, obviously, you won competition. Now, I think the key thing for, for our purposes is I would like Studio Ghibli to continue to exist, you know? Even if Ghibli will continue in a post-Miyazaki and Takahata world, same same thing the way uh, Pixar continues in a post-John Lasseter world. Obviously, very different circumstances for how those things happened. But the show must go on. And not just because Ghibli's a successful brand and shouldn't die, but just because Ghibli should be a launching point for new voices. You know, find that talent, nurture that talent, keep it going. So I have faith that, you know, Ghibli will continue post Hayo, but we'll see. And from here, when Marnie was there, 2014, six more years later, we have the return of Goro with Earwig and the Witch. The 2020s Earwig and the Witch, which debuted on HBO Max, uh, pandemic release, so not uh, really released in theaters, I believe at all. And uh, Goro Miyazaki's third venture for Ghibli, following up from Up on Poppy Hill, Notably, Ghibli's first film that was not hand-drawn animation. This is 3D animation, computer-generated animation. Stark change. Now, to me, the animation isn't quite as good. I wouldn't say it's badly animated, but the Ghibli animation just has so much life to it, as we know. It stands out, it grabs you, it transports you, it's lush and detailed and timeless, too. You don't quite get that feeling from Earwig's animation. And it's a big demerit. I think the worst worst of sin of Earwig is just not a very good story. I guess there's some fun stuff to it, but I didn't find too much of it compelling. It I guess some of the stuff with like the witch's brew was like a smorgasbord of some other Ghibli stuff, but this one was critically panned at the time. It's not well liked. I did not like it, and it's a misfire. And I feel kind of bad for Goro Miyazaki, who was, at this point, a pariah with Ghibli fans raked over the coals, because I thought For Mop on Poppy Hill was a solid, if unspectacular film, a worthy film to release, you know? But between Irig and the Witch being kind of a visual like abomination to many, and Tales from Ursi just being such a flat, missed potential type of effort, I'm very curious if Goro has something else for the studio, or if he still wants to do this. You know, he was not always like a film creator, you know, before this happened um, in the shadow of his dad, you know. Um, Also, he made Ranja the Robber's Daughter, this Ghibli produced television series that was on Amazon Prime. Perhaps that's actually his best um, received thing. It's pretty well liked. I actually haven't seen it. Um, Not too sure. But yeah, Eerie in the Wish, um, there's really not much to recommend about it. I mean, we're talking, what, 23, soon to be 24 Ghibli films. You have to watch all the other ones, I'd say, before you watch Earwig. Um Yeah. Also, I guess I should note that um, in, was it 2017, was it? Or 2018, you had The Red Turtle come out. This is a film that was, co- sorry, 2016. The Red Turtle comes out. This is gets an Oscar nomination. It's co-produced by Studio Ghibli. Other studios like the French studio Wild Bunch were involved. And Ghibli has done a lot of that else in the past. They've co-produced things. They've done you know collaborative work on pieces of other things. TV, uh, other movies, commercial stuff. But The Red Turtle, um, it's a co-pro by Ghibli, but it's not like really branded or presented as a Ghibli film. I haven't seen it yet. I know it's very well liked. I'd like to see it. But I, I chose to skip it for the purposes of this because it's not usually thought of as like a core Ghibli work. But yeah, that's Eerie and the Witch. And that's the first 23 Studio Ghibli films. Again, I will be talking about The Boy and the Heron when it comes out. But now it's time to do the rankings, the tier list. All these films, gotta rank them. Gotta put them in tiers. What is the best? What are their, the worst or the least best Let's get to it. All right, so that's 23 
Studio Ghibli films. Obviously, I haven't seen The Boy and the Heron yet, so let me rank the 23 films I have seen. Again, discounting The Red Turtle, discounting uh, the series Ranja, The Robert's Daughter, any other pre-Ghibli stuff from Takahata and Miyazaki, any of the co-pro, like, assistive work that Ghibli did, just the core films, and of course, including Nausicaa in this. So, I have it here as tiers, but I also have overall numbered rank. So, in my bottom tier, and of course, these tiers are not grades, these are just obviously all relative, where I think very few Ghibli films I would consider bad. It's more so that they are lower tier in comparison to the high bar of Ghibli, of course. That should make perfect sense, I think. But of course, this is my personal ranking, just based on what I think the movie achieves, the ambition of the movie, the animation quality, the rewatchability of it, all those things just kind of factor in and how I per, uh, per perceive the movies today after having seen all of them, having seen some of them many times. So yeah, let's get into it. My bottom tier, 23, I have Earwig and the Witch, 22, My Neighbors the Yamadas, 21, Tales from Earthsea, and 20, The Cat Returns. I really don't think Earwig and the Witch worked at all, so that's kind of an obvious bottom, especially with it being the animation style that does not work for a Ghibli fan. Um, and then My Neighbors the Amadas, which I also did not connect with that comic strip style. I think it, there's just not a lot for me to really latch onto with that one. Tales from Ursi, another movie that, you know, I have it over the first two at my bottom tier just because. I at least was intrigued by a lot of the early world building and the animation quality, but there's like not a coherent story here. And Cat Returns uh, really just felt like a superfluous spinoff to me. And even if it's it's fine, I wouldn't call it bad, but it just never, I think, rises above just being like a perfectly okay children's movie. There's not a whole lot under the hood with Cat Returns. So that's my bottom tier. Uh, so now going to the next tier up, uh, C tier here. We have number 19, When Marnie Was There, number 18, From Up on Poppy Hill, number 17, Palm Poco, and number 16, Whisper of the Heart. I think the only one here that's probably a controversial, like lower tier, is Whisper of the Heart. That's a film that has a lot of fans. I've seen it routinely in many people's top tens for Ghibli, so I'm quite aware that a lot of people really like that one. For me, Whisper of the Heart, you know, it... I think the kind of the lack of conflict with it always kind of rubbed rubbed against me, and it, it felt a bit ordinary. I, I think it's it's a good movie. As a, earlier, of course, I said good things about it, but I think more so I have Whisper of the Heart all the way down at 16 because I think of the strength of other Ghibli films and not so much a slight against Whisper of the Heart. Same thing with Palm Poco, which I liked despite its faults. You know, from Up on Poppy Hill, I also liked, but it, it's too simple and... Um, uh, I don't want to say one note, but it really, it is just kind of what it is, and it's okay at doing that, so not too ambitious, and when Marnie was there, I also never truly connected with, so that's my uh, s second lower tier, now moving up to the B tier, number 15, Ocean Waves, number 14, Arietti, number 13, Ponyo, number 12, The Wind Rises, and number 11, Only Yesterday. To some people, this is very high for Ocean Waves. I have it all the way up at 15, you know, on my third tier. As I said, you know, despite its, I think, simplicity, this one just really works for me. I, I appreciated that love triangle mess. I thought it was quite fun. Um, so I acknowledge I'm higher on Ocean Waves than many, but I think it's a bit underrated. You know, a lot of people talk about Whisper of the Heart as an underrated Ghibli movie. To me, Ocean Waves is an underrated film as well. Um, and then, yeah, I think, you know, Ponyo, as I mentioned, to me, that's the least successful of Miyazaki's films. Not that it's bad, certainly not. Arietti, I liked, liked it a lot. It's probably the my favorite animation of this whole tier here. But, you know, I think plot-wise, it's lacking a bit from the top of the top here. Wind Rises, I liked it quite a bit. Again, I think it's just the strength of what's to come has it this low. And Only Yesterday, another one that perhaps lesser seen to the Ghibli faithful, but also I would say underrated in the sense that I thought it was very mature, uh, like, you know, two-pronged storyline, and I thought it was just very effective at, at what it was trying to tell. Definitely a movie for adults. So that's my B tier. Now moving on to the A tier. 
My A tier is pretty long. Number 10, Kiki's Delivery Service. Number 9, My Neighbor Totoro. Number 8, The Tale of Princess Kaguya. Number 7, Castle in the Sky. Number 6, Porco Rosso. Number 5, oh sorry, I messed that up. Number 8, Castle in the Sky. Number 7, The Tale of Princess Kaguya. Number 6, Porco Rosso. Number 5, Grave of the Fireflies. Number 4, How's Moving Castle. So, if I had more tiers to work with here, with the tier maker graphic, I probably would have broken this down even more. Where, like, all the way at the bottom, I probably have Earwig and Yamadas and Earthsea all the way at the bottom, and then Cat Returns and its like own little bottom tier just slightly above. Similarly, with this top, top tier, right, I would probably break out Porco Rosso, Kaguya, Castle in the Sky, Totoro, and Kiki, slightly below Howl's and Grave. But, I mean, it's tough. I think I, I, I would happily move around basically this entire tier. That's the point of doing tiers, right? I think these are all very, very close. The uh, I think almost every movie in this list has been a top three for some Ghibli fan. Again, speaks to the strength of this filmography here. I guess to some, me having Totoro down at nine might be a bit low. Um, as I said in the beginning... Totoro's a movie I definitely have a lot of respect and reverence for, but it's it's never been my absolute favorite, even though I acknowledge how great it is. Part of me wants to have Kaguya a bit higher than this, although I just don't know if it's quite as relatable, or not as relatable, revisitable, or as, like, grabbing as some of the other stuff here. Like, Porco Rosso, maybe that's high for some people, number six, but to me that's just an absolutely great time. It's so good at what it is, you know. Great with the Fireflies. Number five, Howl's Moving Castle. Number four, part of me thinks Grave of the Fireflies is a stronger achievement than Howl's Moving Castle, but I definitely want to watch Howl's Moving Castle more than Grave. Obviously, they're two very different movies. Grave of the Fireflies is a big downer, obviously. I think it's a great achievement, but Howl's Moving Castle, to me, is a more rewatchable film, and it's one I've rewatched more. So I kind of go back and forth on those. You know, Castle in the Sky, very underrated. Kiki's Delivery Service, a gem. You know, I think this is a, a very strong tier, which of course leaves us with the very top tier, the S tier. Number three, Spirited Away. Sorry, number three, Nausicaa, The Valley of the Wind. Number three, uh, sorry, number three, Nausicaa, The Valley of the Wind. Number two, Spirited Away. Number one, Princess Mononoke. My graphic is slightly off here. So I think for the longest time, I was I had Nausicaa above Spirited Away, which is why the graphic is misleading. But I think Spirited Away is a slightly stronger comp uh, achievement, for sure. And to I think to many, Nausicaa being in this S tier, Nausicaa being number three, that's probably high to many. But to me, I fell in love with that movie the moment I saw it. It's always had a really special place in my heart. And... I think it completely holds up in such a transformative film, transportive, um, amazing message to this day. I really, really adore Nausicaa. Spirited Away and Mononoke, though, I think if you're being objective, these are like the two goats, and there's really not a case for something else. Like, I don't want to hear someone tell me Totoro is better than these movies. It is not. You can like it more, for sure. It's not as good. Uh, Spirited Away so unique for so many reasons such a visual feast and also just so incredibly compelling talk about re rewatchable spirit away is a complete gem just a masterpiece and mononoke to me again the moment i saw that movie um i never thought like something like nausicaa could be one up for me and then i saw mononoke and like to me that's the greatest anime film ever one of the greatest animated films period ever um i think the richness and maturity of the themes in that film combined with just the epic scale and the strong set pieces when you get the memorable characters um just so much to it um yeah man love mononoke so much so yeah spirit away two mononoke one nausicaa three i guess again if i had extra tiers maybe i'd have spirit away and mononoke in a tier then below that maybe i'd have nausicaa and maybe Howls and Fireflies pretty close. And then I had the rest of my A tier again. Uh, rankings hard. But let me know, what is your 
Ghibli ranking because everyone has a different ranking. We're talking about 23, almost soon to be 24 films to probably make a list of. Everyone has a different opinion. But when you're talking about such a fabled and historical output, such as Studio Ghibli, it's a really fun thing to rank and analyze other people's rankings and because there's so much opinion to share about something so beloved as this filmography. So very excited and happy that I like buckled down and did this ranking. Obviously, this took a lot of time. Uh, some of these movies I had not seen until this year, you know. And with The Boy and the Heron coming out uh, very soon in the United States, we know later this year, what a better time than to talk about Ghibli to this point. So, of course, I will be reviewing The Boy and the Heron when that film comes out. Check the link below for that once it's out. Make sure you subscribe, of course, to get that, not miss it. YouTube.com slash NostalgiaPod. Linktree.com slash NostalgiaPod. Please leave a comment about anything about Studio Ghibli. There's so much to talk about. What is your ranking? What is your favorite Ghibli film? What part of my ranking is the most wrong, in your opinion? I'd love to hear it. Um, yeah, and I gotta say, like, I'm going to Japan. I'm gonna hit the Ghibli Museum in just a few weeks. Very excited to do that. Actually, by the time you're hearing this, I'll have been to the Ghibli Museum. I'm gonna see the short Borrow the Caterpillar that's only shown in the museum. Excited about that. Hit that merch. Um, that'll be fun. And what's so funny about me going to Japan now is the boy and the heron, aka How Do You Live, is like the Japanese translation. That'll be playing in Japan when I'm there, but of course there's no English subtitles. There's no English dub for this movie yet. It, of course, it'll happen when it gets the North American release, but that that is not ready yet. Um, so I don't have. I, I could see the boy and the heron, but I don't think it's wise to see a movie I literally can't understand. It'd be fun to watch the visuals, and I'm sure I'd love to come back and try and say, "Here's my review" without understanding any dialogue. Um, that that's probably worth something, but it's not as valuable as, of course, actual real review. So I think I'm just gonna wait. But tempting. But yeah, l leave a comment. Let me know uh, how you're feeling about Ghibli, and I'll see you soon.